mal sagen für alle, herzlich willkommen hier in unseren, zu unserem ECM-Diskurs. Ich werde jetzt alle stumm schalten, weil wir so ein bisschen viele Nebengeräusche haben, aber fühlt euch nicht äh, verstummt. Wir haben auch einen Chat, äh, wenn es Fragen gibt, immer jederzeit gerne reinschreiben, den werde ich verfolgen. Und es gibt im Anschluss auch noch genug Zeit, dann auch direkt Fragen zu stellen. Aber jetzt mache ich mal kurz alles stumm. Und ich mache mich auch stumm und übergebe der Luisa. Ja, yeah. hello, welcome everybody. Um, who joins us for another event in the ECM discourse series. This is a series that is dedicated to topics um, related to exhibitions, curating and, um, and mediating art and um, beyond that. And we are so very happy to welcome tonight um, as our guest lecturer, Julia Grosse. Um, Julia Grosse um, is an um, um, artistic director, co-founder and artistic director of Contemporary End, um, a dynamic and plat platform comprising publications Contemporary End magazine and Comp Contemporary End America Latina magazine, as well as Contemporary End projects and Contemporary End education. So it's a platform that is very much aiming at, um, at um, giving, um, um, giving um, visibility and also um, platform being a platform for discourse um, around um, global art production, I would say. Uh, Julia Gross is a lecturer at the Institute for Art and Context at the University of the Arts in Berlin. She studied art history, German literature and media studies, and she worked as a columnist and art journalist in uh, London and for, for, the, um, for the daily um, Taz, Tageszeitung, uh, for Frankfurter Allgemeine Sonntagszeitung, Architectural Digest, and for the Süddeutsche Zeitung. Um, she has published articles in various art publications and co-edited co books, and her publication Ein Leben lang, um, published in 2018, um, was also very much well um, received. In 2020, she curated Friendly Confrontations, a festival for global art and institutional critique um, at the Kammerspiele in München. And just yesterday, um, together with Yvette Mutumba, uh, the other founder of Contemporary End, she received the European Culture Manager of the Year Award um, that was um, yeah, given to the, to the founders and directors of Contemporary End. And so congratulations to you, Julia, and we're so very happy to have you with us uh, tonight. Um, you. Your talk is entitled Beyond Countering the Canon, a digital art magazine as a platform for global contexts and discourses. Um, and it's very much related to questions that, are, um, that we are dealing with for many, many years. So it's so, so great to have you with us. And I just hand over to you and I'm looking forward to your presentation. And of course, also to the discussion afterwards, we have mm -hmm. um, the possibility to have a Q&A afterwards and also um, a discussion with everybody who's here with us tonight. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thanks so much for the invitation, first of all. And yeah, thanks, you know, to all the visitors uh, or, or audience or, you know, people who want to uh, join um, us tonight, etc. And um, I was uh, wondering, would you um, share the screen now or should I? Maybe because the first slide is uh, quite formal, a bit boring maybe, but um, yeah, maybe. Ah, oh, that's cool. Oh, oh yeah, that's, yeah, of course, no, that's, that's, that's perfect. So yeah, thanks again for the invitation. And um, the funny thing is that I was supposed to give this talk six months ago, <laughs> physically in person, which never happened, obviously, because it was three days prior to the first big fat lockdown. Um, and um, so that didn't happen. And um, I'm still super happy that I'm here tonight anyway, not in person, but um, like this. I, I might pop out for a second, maybe in 10 minutes to get some water because I forgot. <laughs> because normally, you know, when you 
do a panel or give a talk every you know somebody's putting water here and i was i was just i just didn't think about anything today so yeah i'm super happy to be here and um thanks Luisa, for the nice um um introduction um as she said i'm, I'm julia i'm uh, together with yvette mutumbo the co-founder and artistic director of contemporary and uh, which we always kind of define as a dynamic platform, um, kind of bringing together different layers of activities around contemporary art practice from Africa and the global diaspora. That's how we kind of define it. And um, um, what you can see here is um, um, the landing page of um, the website or the, the magazine we have, because we have two magazines, Contemporary and Magazine, which you see here, and another one, uh, Contemporary and America Latina magazine, um, which I'm just quickly talking about um, a bit later. And um, we have a big relaunch right now. So what you see here is kind of old, so everything will look nicer next week. Because, uh, what we, because when we started 2013, um, we had this idea to um, mainly create or, or start, um, establish a platform um, that makes artistic production from Africa and the global diaspora more visible, but also connect these artistic producers and voices from these areas in order to creating a constantly growing network of voices and perspectives in a way. And um, since then, let's say because we started as a magazine, we kind of, I don't know, broke loose, not, but um, developed many arms of different activities which go way beyond the um, pure digital activities now because we do many things on the ground as well or um, physically and um, I'll just talk about them in a second. So that's why what you see here is the website but um, what we have like hopefully in 10 days from now, from now is more broader and showing the different areas of what we do from um, you know projects, um, digital projects but as well uh, physical um, projects. And um, you know, of course, you know, the idea to, um, to launch a magazine uh, with this focus on contemporary art from Africa and the global diaspora is nothing new. So we didn't reinvent the wheel in a way. Um, you had, for example, Revue Noir, maybe you've heard of this uh, publication in the 90s, um, focusing on the diaspora and African um, art um, production as well. And uh, you still have NKA or NKA from the US, uh, more like a very academic journal and um, founded by Okwe Invisor and Salah Hassan, uh, to name just a few. But um, compared to, for example, examples such as NKR, um, who are very academic, which is fantastic, um, in a way our approach is more the opposite or completely different because um, with CN, the aspect of accessibility is the very bottom line, if you like, and that happens on many levels in our work. Um, accessibility is, for example, in terms of being uh, readable as an online platform from all over the globe and beyond uh, physical, let's say, distribution um, limitations. So if you're a magazine, um, for example, Freeze magazine, you can't assure that Freeze magazine is in um, the library um, of the art school in Addis Ababa, for example, because it is, you know, it never, it never reaches the library of uh, the art school in Addis Ababa and this is why we um, from the beginning on in terms of accessibility um, decided to say okay we have to do uh, or we have to go online um, in order to be you know to be read or consumed from all different um, perspectives and all different parts um, of the globe. Um, sorry having said that um, all our produced contents, interviews, features, essays etc are um, free um, you know, as most of our readers are rather young, which is great, um, in the early mid, early to mid twenties, um, late twenties as well. And, um, yeah, that makes us very proud that we don't have, you know, any paywalls for the content we produce. Um, and as well, accessibility is important, um, when it comes to the content itself, um, in our, let's say, features, essays, etc. Uh, we consciously, um, um, try to bring uh, complex topics across, but um, really try to explain them in an understandable way that, um, um, let's say, um, a broad global or a broader global audience can understand 
what we want to bring across you know even even though topics sometimes um, are very complex um, um, cultural political context um, um, context around um, um, post-colonial debates and discourses etc but we always try to or uh, you know not force but <laughs> try to uh, convince our writers to 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 keep it simple which is very tricky um, in terms of writing to 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 bring um, context uh, or com complex contexts um, across in a simple way but this is something uh, we find um, super important and um, since we launched in 2013 uh, the initial idea of an art magazine has grown into, as I said, um, a whole cosmos in a way with a you know publication and um, we well have um, sections such as science projects and other uh, um, areas called science and education. But I come to this later. Um, maybe what I might find interesting or important to uh, explain is the let's say the meaning behind uh, the term the end. Um, because we use CN in the sense of that, uh, for us, an artist is primarily uh, contemporary in the first place and um, end, you know, end maybe from Ghana with parents in London or a gallery in Milan, etc. Uh, means that we don't use uh, geographical info in order to describe an artist and his or her practice. You know, because very often when it comes to, uh, um, let's say, geographical info, of an artist, you start to immediately open a box. Yeah. So for example, Okwe Indiza was one of um, very popular examples where you know he lived in, you know, he might have come from Nigeria, fine, but he uh, lived in the US and in Germany for decades. But still the media referred to him as the Nigerian or Afri African curator. And this is something we just want to overcome, you know, this this tendency to always grab the geographical um, info. Uh, when it comes to um, to to certain um, or to artists from certain um, areas, yeah, you would never say, oh, you know, Gerhard Richter, the European artist or the German the German artist, maybe. You have, you know, but no, you just you just you know you just read uh, Gerhard Richter and not the German artist or the European artist Gerhard Richter. And this is something we find very important to make this point. And that's why we call it contemporary end. And um, another thing is that. Um, the idea of art from Africa or the African artist is something for us that just doesn't exist because, uh, you know, in a way what connects an artist, um, a painter from Joburg with a concept artist from, I don't know, from, from Ghana with an um, Egyptian performance artist who lives in London, yeah? Conceptually, probably nothing at all. And yet there's this, let's say, tendency to, to, to put their practices in a box, um, you know, by getting out this, this this label African art or African artists etc and um, this is something we have been working on in our practice uh, at Contemporary and by not avoiding these words um, but rather going beyond these ideas behind these words if 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 that makes sense what I, what I'm saying um, because for example um, what we try to not mention or we just don't mention it are these very let's say um, inflationary used terms such as right now obviously decol decolonialism this is something we um we kind of practice in this way but we don't name name it all the time yeah because it's funny every library every curriculum every museum every festival right now is trying to decolonize itself yeah this is um this funny <laughs> tendency we see around us a lot and um we rather i don't know we rather try to move beyond these boxes and um yeah by simply acting by it and uh, rather not naming it or put a title over the practice we're doing um Maybe, uh, can you go to slide three? Um, this is um, us, a group picture of the core team of the end, um, but um, obviously not all of us because um, it's a global network of um, dozens of um, um, writers, artists, curators um, who work with us on a daily basis. Um, and even that group you see here is not entirely based in Berlin. Um, some are in uh, Colombia, another one is in, in London, another one in the south of uh, Germany, for example. Um, but um, guess, you know, there's 
as well sometimes a tendency to say oh where's your magazine from where or the platform where, where does it sit is it is it from berlin and um we always say obviously the platform is there where the network is and the network is is there it's it's, it's all over the place and uh, it's you know in ghana in nigeria in the us in france in germany etc and um yeah and this is something we find very um, you know important when it comes to describing what the cn network is um interesting as well as that the the audience or the readers are very global as well. Um, we have readers from over 150 countries. Um, funny enough, the main readership is from the US since the beginning. We never really found out why, but um, the Americans just um, obviously love ideas, Black Americans about Africa as well as the motherland, etc. So for them, it's um, like a treasure island to 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 see um, what we're covering, you know, or, you know, the new artists we're, we're featuring, etc. For them, it is uh, very fascinating. We have, we get this feeling. So, and um, maybe one, the next slide, slide, slice, slide, slide, not slice, <laughs> the next slide. Um, this is, um, yeah, again, the magazine, as you see, it um, functions more or less uh, like a classical art magazine with features, interviews, essays, columns, daily news exhibitions from literally, you know, all over the world. Maybe the next slide. Yes. Um, having said that, from all over the world, uh, we produce, like other magazines, you know, of course, daily contents around contemporary art. Uh, but with a small but for us important uh, difference that <clears throat> if we talk about the art world, uh, quote unquote, we obviously don't refer to a small or, you know, the small um, usual suspect circle of New York, London, Berlin, Paris, Amsterdam, Basel, LA, etc. But we're looking truly for global perspectives or what's really happening on a global scale. And um, let's say don't want to divide art scenes into the West and the rest. And um, that's why our events come from uh, London or Berlin, but they also come from Nairobi or Joburg or Lagos or Dar es Salaam. And this is something that um, we have been missing reading for uh, a long time uh, in other art publications and in, in a way that kind of encouraged us uh, to start with the end because we kind of missed this broader idea that if I want to read, for example, a review from, from, from a show running in London, that's fine, I can read it. But um, obviously there are shows running in Dar es Salaam or in Khartoum or in Nairobi too. Why, why isn't there a magazine that brings all these different um, perspectives and positions together? And why, why can I find them in magazines, in, in art, in art uh, publications? And that was kind of one, um, yeah, the trigger in a way seven years ago why we started with the end to kind of, um, yeah, fill a gap of things in art product and productions who obviously were there. So um, maybe the next one we have. Um, oh, can you go one? Uh, oh, no, the, uh, the one before. Yes, 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 that one is cool. Um, we have. Um, established shorter and uh, longer running series on topics and discourses um, which do not necessarily find their way into let's say other art magazines as they may seem to marginal. Um, I just want to present a few for example this year uh, due to the various eruptions we all experienced. Uh, we started several spontaneous series that reacted to the current situation and what you're looking at here is the series um, hashtag museum shutdown a kind of let's say intensive picture gallery from the closed museums exhibitions, um, which was one of the, um, on the one hand, like a solid act of solidarity with museums and art spaces from Joburg to Berlin, et cetera. But it was also a nice offer to the readers because you know they couldn't visit the museums and art spaces either. So by offering these walks around the shows there at least became an idea uh, what was behind closed doors at the moment. And um, this is Duro Olowu, for example, um, at the MCA in Chicago. And um, the next one, you can, the next one is um, at, uh, in Florence, uh, Florence uh, Villa Romana, um, in the work by Sonia Elizabeth Barrett. 
and that series was quite um, popular and um, we just started to show it again as the museums, um, for example, in Germany are closed, closed again. In, the, in Vienna they closed as well, right? The museums, yeah. So that's why, you know, we started with the series again. Um, the next slide, please. Um, another series which ran over several weeks uh, called We Are, uh, launched with the intention to give especially um, creators from POC perspectives in the, uh, in the US a space for their voice and their, um, you know, um, feelings in a way as well, because it was uh, at a very early stage uh, or time of um, eruptions after the murder of um, by George Floyd and others. And we invited um, different, let's say, MoMA curators, um, um, new to the scene artists, renowned artists, poets, senior professors like Deborah Willis, um, to leave like short or long or very emotional statements on this kind of wall of voices, as how we call it. And um, the next slide, please. Slide, slide. What did I say? Yeah, thanks. And um, as well, we also consciously during this time, that time, and still, that's what we're still doing, um, open the platform to give um, groups and individuals, let's say, a space or platform to speak out, to publish open letters to museums or um, yeah, petitions and, and different formats to just, um, I don't know, say what they want or, 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 or leave their voice. And um, this is what you're looking here at, uh, maybe you, some of you saw it as well. Uh, it's an open letter from um, Swiss black culture producers addressing the Swiss cultural institutes, uh, institutions and institutes. And for example, we had an uh, open letter by a young, young woman, um, um, Afro-German, Afro-German woman addressing a large museum in Leipzig where she experienced forms of racism, racism in her time during um, when she was an intern there. And um, we had the feeling that one could literally feel that individuals like her, for example, suddenly, um, I don't know, felt to have enough backup and courage to stand up, um, to express themselves and, you know, at the same time know that their voice um, is finally, or has been heard or is heard right now. So that was, um, or still is quite um, important to us to kind of open or offer the platform um, as, a space where people can just voice um, their feelings and 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 um, um, the things important to them. Um, the next slide. Um, what we also find very important is to make a look back, let's say, uh, into the past events and discourses, uh, which is for us an important tool. Um, to show that contemporary art from African perspectives obviously isn't, isn't something that has just popped up 20 years ago with Okwe Inbuzo's uh, Documenta 10 or with uh, Jean-Hubert Martin's uh, Magicien de la Terre in 18, uh, 18, 1989. But obviously um, art histories uh, have you know, existed outside uh, the West as well. Um, and there are many art histories and not one art history that we're telling or that we're teaching. And for example, when I uh, studied art history, which is a long time ago, so <laughs> like uh, uh, 12 years ago, um, I, um, for me, it was clear there's an avant-garde, there's modernism, uh, there's art history. But when I thought uh, of an avant-garde, you know, that happened or took place in Paris, in Berlin, in New York, etc., yeah, because nobody teached me at my uh, institute in Bochum, which was quite advanced, but nobody teached me that obviously there are dozens, dozens of avant garde in the world, yeah. And um, to kind of unlearn this took me, I don't know, many years as well to unlearn that there are many avant garde and many art histories and many um, modernisms. And that's why, you know, this kind of um, series where we look back and uh, look back in history to see, okay, there are you know, many forms of um, um, collectives, avant-garde collectives who um, worked 
I don't know, in Senegal in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 40s, um, you know, to bring this, to make this visible is um, quite important to us. Um, finally, and then I close the chapter about uh, the series and the next slide, please. Um, finally, I just want to um, quickly uh, talk about a very popular series. It doesn't look so glamorous now, but it's quite po popular with our readers. It's called Inside the Library. And here we do present rather smaller or unknown libraries uh, around the globe and um, kind of invite them to, uh, to present, yeah, their very rare and sometimes fantastic collection of art books, pamphlets, fanzines, monographs, which you obviously wouldn't necessarily find at the British Library or at the Stabi, uh, Staatsbibliothek, etc. And uh, what we want to bring across here, um, you know, that there are hidden places who hold a huge, deep knowledge too, and, um, you know, outside the usual suspect big places who claim to have, you know, to inherit all the knowledge. But these places um, have an important knowledge, obviously, too. And um, that's why, you know, with great pleasure, we love to invite and find, first of all, find and invite these um, little libraries to um, to open their their um, treasure 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 chests in a way. And um, the next slide, yes, this is um, another um, arm of our activities because we started, as I said, as a digital magazine, but always, you know, had a fetish for print, as you know, maybe all of you have. You know, we all love print and obviously uh, we always thought maybe alongside um, the online platform it would be nice to have something physical um, to go alongside. And uh, we introduced our first print issue in 2014 uh, during the Dakar Biennale. And that was, um, that's what we've been doing ever since, like publishing two print issues um, per year, always alongside an existing art event. If it, it, you know, if it takes place around the globe. Um, Documenta, Berlin Biennale, Kampala Biennale, Sao Paulo Biennale, etc. And um, yeah, as I said, why print? Because um, for us, it um, is still important to kind of reach uh, certain local communities on the spot. For example, if we are in Dakar or if we are even in Kassel or in Kampala um, and communities who would um, not necessarily um, you know, come from art scenes or art contexts or from the art sector, but who are still interested in art. And, um, you know, even though many art festivals, especially the Biennales, very often must feel like UFOs, you know, invading a community or a city. Um, for us, it's always important to, you know, if we have these magazines to distribute them out, of course, inside the Biennale or whatever the event is, but outside as well. And um, what we do, uh, we always obviously translate the issues into the language spoken in the respective country. Um, um, we would, of course, let's say, never ever um, produce a print issue for the Sao Paulo Biennale, like the one in the center here, um, and produce it in English, yeah, because most of um, um, the people or the Brazilians don't speak necessarily um, English. So, of course, we would produce it in um, in um, Portuguese. And um, this is something we find very, um, yeah, very in important to have these um, um, local, local, local languages um, represented in the magazine, even though, of course, they're colonial languages because Portuguese is not uh, <laughs> the original language in Brazil, but still, this is what 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 we do. For example, this is uh, the actual oh, <laughs> the actual uh, uh, print issue we um, just um, um, launched some weeks ago. And the idea is always that's why it looks so upside down to have um, at least two languages in one um, in one issue. And in this case, it is uh, Portuguese and um, um, Spanish. This is always how we how we design it as a, a flip flip issue. Um, the next slide, please. Yes, what we find super important, obviously, as a network 
um, is to team up and to collaborate with other initiatives. And um, here, um, that was um, on the occasion of the Sao Paulo Biennale. You, I just mentioned the, uh, the issue in the middle of many um, issues you just saw. And uh, we worked um, with a very great Brazilian, black Afro-Brazilian culture initiative, it's called Omenelik, um, who focused rather on um, black Brazilian uh, literature, but it was uh, amazing to, to produce this issue together with them. And we hosted um, a party um, uh, in the busy opening week of the Biennale in Sao Paulo. And we had a big event um, right in the center of the city together with um, like 400 Afro-Brazilian art workers, artists, etc. And uh, many of them came to us afterwards and said, oh, that was um, a very rare occasion that, you know, us as, um, you know, part of the Afro-Brazilian art scene, uh, you know, had, a, had, had an event of, you know, such scale in, right in the center um, of, of Sao Paulo, because normally um, we would do these parties uh, or events in the periphery, far outside the dominating, very, very exclusive um, art circle. And um, because, you know, artistic production uh, of, in this case, Afro-Brazilian uh, perspectives is almost and still, you know, invisible and uh, in the dominant white Brazilian um, art circle or art world. And this doesn't get, let's say better in other Latin American countries. Um, for example, in Peru, uh, um, people told us, you know, when we started researching there, because we feature um, um, these, you know, we feature Afro uh, Latin American topics from these different areas. And uh, we were in Peru and um, yeah, people from the art world there told us, oh, it's great that you're interested in Afro Peruvian art, but we don't have any Afro Peruvian artists here which is obviously um, not true at all because, you know, we are in contact with them and, um, you know, they have a small network, but they're there. And this is something um, which left us really frustrated, these, these, these different kind of um, feedbacks, um, because, you know, we could see that our readers literally, you know, inhaled articles um, featuring um, Afro-Latin American um, art topics and discourses etc um, and um, that kind of you know we gave it a, a little thing and um, think thought sorry and and talked to uh, different funders such as the Goethe Institute for example and the IFA this is the Institute for Auslandsbeziehung and it took us two more years or two more years to um, to convince them to um, launch another magazine focusing on um, Afro-Latin American and Caribbean art perspectives in relation to Africa. And um, maybe the next slide. Yes, and that launched in 2000, or we launched uh, Cient America Latina in 2018 um, in three languages, Spanish, Portuguese, and English um, to really reach um, a broader audience not mainly in Latin America, but obviously in Latin America as well. Uh, what is interesting now when it comes to the readership of CNRL, this is the short, short form, is that um, still Americans are the main readers, which is funny. But the interesting thing is these um, American readers read the, publica uh, the, the publication in Spanish, means that many Latin X, so um, um, Latin, Latin American, um, Latin Americans who live in the U.S. Um, read the magazine, and this is super interesting for us. And thanks to dirty Google analytic, analytics, we can all get these <laughs> get these informations um, out. And maybe another thing, because I just mentioned it comes out in three languages, uh, important to us is the aspect of translation. Because, um, for example, we would not have a text in. Brazilian Portuguese translated into English by, for example, a Portuguese translator sitting in Lisbon. Why? Uh, because, of course, you know, colonial Portuguese is very different in detail from Brazilian Portuguese. And we don't want to, let's say, iron out um, these important subtleties in these different shades of language. So this is why, you know, you have to, in a way, you never do it right. But if you 
at least do it a little bit right, you have to go all the way and say, okay, we want, um, I don't know, an article from, from a black Brazilian a person, but um, if we have someone, as I said, from Portugal to translate it, they would say, okay, this word, I don't know, this word is different, and they would just take them out, and this is something we obviously don't want, because um, for us, the different, not taste, colors and styles of the language is extremely important, but um, yeah, I come to this. Uh, in a second. Uh, the next slide. Um, the aspect I mentioned it already uh, earlier of education uh, is quite important to us as well in our work at oh, SC and at the end. The aspect of education um, as a shared tool has always played yeah, an important uh, role, both in terms of content uh, and in topics related to, let's say, aspects of unlearning, meaning, let's say, the conscious unlearning of internalized exclusive art discourses, et cetera. I just mentioned it in, you know, from my own experience with the different art, or not the different, just the one art history and the one avant-garde, et cetera. And uh, here, for example, we dedicated ourselves entirely to education in a print edition, sorry, uh, edition that we produced together with um, the uneducation team of the Documenta 14 in 2017. And, uh, in our practice at CN, uh, CN we also um, have a huge focus on yeah, the aspect of um, education when it comes to our content and our critical writing itself. Um, the next slide, please. Yes. Um, so um, starting in 2016, uh, with the help of um, several funders, um, the biggest funding we received was from the Ford Foundation, the American uh, Foundation. Um, thanks to that, we were able to realize various critical writing workshops in Africa and the diaspora. Uh, this one you see here was 2016 in Lagos. Um, we had other ones in Nairobi, in Lubumbashi, um, Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, in Kampala, which is in Uganda, in Rwanda, which is in Angola, but it's also in uh, Detroit, in the US. And the idea was, and still is, because they're still running, to invite uh, young writers who are, let's say, interested in focusing more on critical art writing and to work together for several days in a workshop with uh, senior writers from the respective regions. Right now, obviously, we can't do these. We do them um, purely digital now, but um, normally in the, in the past, we did them you know, physically, obviously, and brought these different um, groups together. Uh, what they do, they do, you know, classical text work, but as well, uh, as well sorry, talk um, about topics such as finding your own voice, um, where do I publish, should I start a blog, how would I pitch an article, etc. And uh, what we definitely never wanted to do is, uh, let's say, fly in international journalists in order to impose the perfect feuilleton writing style on young, young artists from Kampala or Rwanda. That was never, you know, in our interest. Um, that's why we always focused on local voices, um, local senior journalists who, you know, have this deep uh, knowledge of the, the respective cultural context and, and um, uh, understand the writing style of the youngster writers as well, because every style is um, different. And, um, what we don't have, for example, um, deliberately, we don't have an in-house style at the end, yeah? Like New York Times and Der Spiegel, you know, this kind of sound that runs through all the text and which is so recognizable at once, one text, you know, one and, you know, all the others. And uh, what drives us is um, to find their own voice in the young writers. Uh, and in a way, our uh, in-house style is uh, to not have an in-house style, but rather to celebrate the diversity of these different yeah, writers and styles. Because, you know, if you, and we had to learn this as well, if you read an article by a young writer from Kampala, it sounds pretty different uh, from the, you know, the feuilleton style um, reviews, you know, from, for example, from a German perspective, but even the Kampala style review sounds very different from uh, a text written by, from, uh, by an art writer from Cairo, yeah? Because maybe, the, the piece from um, writers in Uganda um, who write about art sound more 
decorated, they used more ornamental language, etc. And we had to get used to this as well. And um, since, you know, since we just realized how rich it is to have these different colors of voices, um, you know, we feel very liberated because uh, it, it, it would, it, it would not be an alternative to iron, you know, all these different layers of language out because um, it's very unique and we're very proud about these different styles. Um, the next one, please. Oh yeah, this is, this is, um, a, was a workshop in Nairobi with a great group. Oh, I sound like, <laughs> I wanted to say tremendous, <laughs> like Trump, <laughs> with a great, with a fantastic group. And the great thing is, and this is very important to us, um, that the writers themselves can develop a practice and ideally, um, you know, um, can also earn money with their writing or maybe even enough to live off this. But this is not very realistic because most of them do many things at the same time, maybe curate as well or are photographers at the same time. But, um, you know, the idea is that we kind of help them in their practice in order to publish more and write for national and maybe even international um, uh, media. And uh, what is, or what we feel is super extremely precious right now is that um, um, we have never worked and especially not now, but will never work with um, um, reporters, so-called parachute, parachute journalists who kind of jump off in Dakar for three days in order to report on the Dakar Biennale and then, you know, fly back to, to London or wherever they are. Um, because what we've been doing for the last seven years is really uh, relying on local voices, writers, um, and their, as I said, deep knowledge, um, which they have, you know, developed because they, they live there, they come from that area. And um, this is how we develop our um, precious networks with these local correspondents. Um, it took, you know, took a lot of time. It took seven years to to grow, but um, you know, the, the the overall idea behind is um, this slow way of, you know, building this the, these local structures was really to um, to telling your own story from a local perspective, and uh, which is now with the pandem pandem pandemic even more telling and relevant. And um, we have um, the opinion, or we think, and the next slide please yes and uh um as an addition to these workshops who obviously you know and after three days they're over and then you know um in the worst case you never see them again because you know everybody goes after his or her business etc and that's why we kind of um established a long-term working relationship with um some of these young writers um we call it the mentoring program in in which um the selection of them continue to work with the, their mentors for another year, um, writing or producing one text per month uh, for which we pay a small stipend or a small, small fee. And the idea behind um, this mentoring program is that we, yeah, in a way, want to encourage the youngster writers to go into this job of critical writing and um, you know, in a way, use this job as well as a tool for freedom of speech or freedom of um, expression in a way, because, you know, um, um, because maybe um, the thing is that uh, the problem is we want to encourage them to go into this job and use journalism as a tool or critical writing, art writing in this case as a tool. Um, because being a journalist in um, many of the world's countries, not only African countries, uh, comes with a price or can be risky. Yeah, and uh, because you know, apart from the financial insecurity, because you can't live off writing um, in cities such as Lagos, for example, uh, in some countries um, there's of course also this issue of censorship, a big, big thing. And, um, you know, which can even hit an art writer who, for example, reports a bit too positively about a queer photography exhibition in the city of Dakar, for example. Um, yeah, and um, can really get him or herself in minor or major trouble. And um, 
in one of our workshops, for example, in Kampala in Uganda, we had um, that case that a person from the Secret Service uh, was sitting in the last row, um, just simply to intimidate us and kind of, you know, over watching what we're doing. Because, you know, as soon as it's uh, headlined with critical writing, um, you know, there's this suspicion in terms of, you know, what we're doing, how uh, are we teaching, you know, freedom of speech, which, which in some countries obviously isn't, um, um, isn't wished, let, let's say. Um, so what we do, uh, because we want to, you know, deliberate the writers, but we want to protect them at the same time as well. Uh, we talk to them, we advise them and connect them with uh, many, many initiatives and NGOs who work in that field around artist safety and freedom of expression in African cities as well. So they're no, not all sitting at the UN in, in New York, etc., but they're sitting in the different uh, African countries. And of course, we give them support as a platform as well. So um, here you can see a reportage uh, that two workshop participants from Ethiopia um, did a broad for us about a cultural music venue in Addis Abeba. And they mentioned in the text that drugs are used, you know, consumed in the venue. And this led to um, yeah, massive pressure that was put on, on the two writers um, by the institution or by this events institution. So we, of course, you know, took the two out of this pressure zone, let's say, and discussed and negotiated, negotiated the whole process directly um, with these organizers. And um, this is extremely important to us um, if our writers need help because, you know, they want to write critically. Um, we can offer them a certain kind of, yeah, protection and support if necessary with lawyers, etc. Because, you know, it's so important to you know that the job of or the profession of the journalist or culture journalist doesn't get something young people don't want to do it anymore because it's too dangerous or or just not attractive that's why we kind of really are on the case here um the next slide is uh yes this is another uh on the ground project um we're doing um a quite busy project. Um, it's called the CN Center of Unfinished Business. It's a reading room or kind of walk-in bookcase structure which offers visitors a very diverse and sometimes um, a little bit irritating selection of books in a um, way like focusing on in the widest sense blind spots of colonial power relations uh, which continue you know to still impact um, science and society today. Um, um, the thing is, while we might focus on traces of legacies of colonialism in the center, um, what we weren't interested in when we started this was to, let's say, create a rather academic, unaccessible hand apparat of usual suspect titles around colonialism, post colonialism, decolonialism, etc. And um, rather open this up to. Um, a broader audience who can access this, again, this idea of accessibility. Um, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, this is uh, the same structure as you can see. And um, this is at the HKW in uh, Berlin. And um, we were invited by the um, Transmediale, the um, digital festival always taking place in January to um, install and show um, us our center here and um, this is the original structure we have been built. not we didn't build this but uh, we um, designed it together or we created it together with a young design uh, group and um, this is very it's not heavy it's very light and this can travel to i don't know to different places it, had, it has been traveling to um, different places and museums but we have different shapes and forms and shades of the um, center as well so it's not always this kind of um, 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 construction you see here. Yes, and this is um, a smaller version uh, in Dresden. This is right now um, at the uh, Lipsius Bau in Dresden right now in, as part of the Angela Davis exhibition, which is unfortunately closed right now. But um, as you see, this is more like a smaller um, um, 
smaller residency, that's how we call it, if, if they are smaller um, versions of the original structure, but still obviously with the same idea. And it's important for us that it's always an encounter between us and the institution um, we are meeting, which means that uh, we bring our books, obviously, but they, the institutions, need to open their library up to us as well so that we can go into their books and get out books from their collection, which become part of the exhibited center during the time of the exhibition, obviously, you know, as a kind of a critical and playful and sometimes irritating dialogue as well. Um, because um, we had very funny moments, for example, with the case of the Transmediale, you just saw the picture, um, that we went to through the books of, uh, of um, their collection of the Transmediale. And the funny thing is that 90% of their books were focused on early 2000 net culture topics uh, written by old white Dutch men. Yeah, and that was really funny. And we thought, okay, obviously we don't leave these books out, but we take them and not all of them, but you know, selection of 30 of them and put them into the structure in order to create a dialogue with the books we have. And um, that notion of, let's say, irritation is good and very important um, because as it reflects a focus of interest or inclusive or exclusive tendencies, which uh, we are not shy to show, let's say. Um, the next slide, please. Yes, here you have a selection uh, of these books, which um, maybe from first sight wouldn't match really. And um, as I said, we're rather interested in the question how intensively colonial legacies still bleed in all parts of today's, uh, today's society. And that thought kind of opened uh, opened a whole new world of possibilities for us when it came to, you know, what kind of books should we bring together? Because in a way, everything is impacted by colonial oppression. You know, that's why we have books on Wall Street, on expressionist art, on fashion, on pop culture. You know, even the good old Gombre history of art has its place in our center. You can see it here on the left. And um, um, people were like, oh, why, why is the Gombre here, what, what, you know? what has it to do here and uh, the thing is obviously Gombrich is important because you know um, it claims to tell the history of art and obviously it doesn't tell us the history of art it it is full of blanks and these blanks tell a story you know because they don't tell a story they tell us a story and that's why um, that's why exactly um, these blanks do are of big interest for us and that's why uh, um, is part of our collection as well, as you can see, you know, a book uh, by Queen Natifa. And to put them next to each other um, is obviously big fun to us. Um, yeah, you can go to the next one. This is another example. Um, these two are, um, um, these two, oh, no, this, this picture you see is um, from the exhibition, which just closed some weeks ago at the, um, Museum Ludwig in Köln, where we had this center in a big uh, version installed as well. And um, let's say through this openness, when it comes to the selection of books, uh, the center is very accessible, as I said, this is super important to us and absolutely non-didactic because this is um, yeah, very key to us too, because um, um, we don't wanna, you know, we don't wanna teach anyone entering the center yeah or what we are rather interested in is uh, educate through irritation in the widest sense you know why is this book here why is this book next to that one i don't understand why why are they here and um the idea is as well that we install them in the first step this is our curatorial, curatorial step maybe the first um laying hands on the books putting them in a um associate very associative order together and then we leave it to the visitors um, who come throughout the weeks and months to take them out and rearrange as they wish and um, because that creates very very interesting and irritating or I don't know surprising uh, combinations and associations again and um, we think that through this uh, kind of narration or, or narrating a story um, people get a feeling for what we want to you know what we want to say 
a, a, a way better because it's uh, non-didactic but more associative and associative and still people get get a slight idea how you know colonial traces or legacies are still you know have an impact on all all these different um, um, areas of society which we you know which are reflected um, um, in the books what we don't have as well because uh, we're not a library we are um, a reading room and that's why we don't have a handout by a bibliography um, of the titles and uh, we don't some titles in corners like a for africa in one corner etc um, but really you know play with the impact of associations and irritations um, when you see these books in order um the next slide please yeah this is another example um, of um, the mixture of books um, next please yes and um as we never um we, we never the thing is we you know we install the center but we never really you know it's a fully participative hands-on reading room uh in which you know grassroots in initiatives can meet students can work uh, visitors can just come and read but um you know we we, we we never know in a way of course we can see what people used and where they put books etc but um we wanted to kind of trace or at least think how they used uh, or, or get an idea how they used the library and that's why we started with these you know just stupid posted posted ideas and um just put some piles there and and and, and pens and such as you know tell us what you think leave a mark say something yeah if you like and um that kind of has exploded during the last one and a half years and we obviously uh, love it you can see um, um some post-its at the hkv um, um where they you know where people left um, um messages and and and, and comments etc can you go to the next one please yeah this is in cologne where people as as you can see kind of went a little bit wild and um and um, that was when the museum opened again um, some weeks after the lockdown and uh, you know we had the feeling that people were like wow oh, i wanted to i don't know just exploded and um the next one yes this is the structure in cologne uh made out of wood and we love these posters because you know they are fantastic and simple tool and a voice or a trace which says um we think a lot about how the visitors are using the center what are they reading which translations in so in which books they might find problematic maybe yeah uh, which book they hate other books they love which books they're missing in the collections etc and you know they leave all these comments and this is for us is is uh very precious and uh, we still don't know what to do with these posters but obviously we're collecting them since uh since we started this and you know many of these sketches or, or yeah, many do sketches obviously because they find themselves in a museum but often you know even these posters get in dialogue with each other and start to comment um, on others etc and um yeah and this structure as you can see at the end of the exhibition was really covered in these posted and looked more like a holy shrine or a spiritual temple you know where all the tourists come and and and, and put something so it, it looked a bit ridiculous but we still thought it's um it's amazing and the next slide um as i mentioned we do um the smaller iterations of the center as well and this is at uh, the school in your city in vienna some of you or many of you might recognize the amazing purple floor and um, what we sometimes do and i'm looking forward to do it tomorrow first time digitally as well with um, the master uh, students as well here at ecm are uh, uh, reading exercises in the different centers uh, here it's uh, we did this session um, uh, at school in uh, in the Herrengasse and uh, yeah please go there if you haven't been but I'm sure almost all of you know it anyway and uh, the idea of these exercises is to um, to do a big out loud reading together 
but in a very associative way again. So everybody has, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes to pick a book uh, from the library and read out loud a short passage from it. You know, can be some sentence, can be, I don't know, half, a half page, um, followed by the next person who feels that her passage maybe from her book works nicely or maybe it's irritating and that that's why it fits nicely um, and um, the beautiful thing about this session and we did this first time together with the um, education team of uh, the documenter the nice thing about it is that um, um, you know it it, uh, it creates this I don't know this this beautiful alternative uh, narration um, which uh, kind of um, creates, no, not creates, kind of fills these, these gaps I was just talking about, um, you know, because um, by doing this together, this, this, this selecting and listening and reading, um, um, it creates this kind of uh, alternative and very um, uneration and we, we do this together. And this is um, very beautiful. And the um, discussions um, coming out of this, after the reading are very beautiful as well. So um, I'm very uh, curious how this is gonna work tomorrow um, when we do it uh, digitally, because you know, every, the idea tomorrow is that uh, the students, um, the master students um, put, pick books from their um, you know, personal library, uh, which I would do as well. I, I just do like this and take a book from this shelf. So, and then, or two, I mean, let's see, maybe we do two rounds, but uh, yeah, we've never, we've never done this um, uh, digitally and with the shelves of, you know, of the, of the person, of their private shelves. So let's see uh, what, what kind of narrations we're going to create tomorrow. So um, what time is it? Do we still have, uh, what time? when did we start? At seven. Oh God, I'm, did I speak an hour? How long, how long the, um, Julia, we still have uh, till uh, uh, till half past eight, so we still have like um, twenty five minutes. Cool. No, because I yeah, oh, cool, perfect. But it yeah, would be great course. to have time for questions. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me just wrap this up in four four minutes because I want to uh, just quickly introduce uh, a project I am working on with Yvette. Yes, this this because it's. It's so nice, and uh, it's called. Uh, it's a project I'm doing together with Yvette and um, another uh, curator, Paula Nascimento, who um, who did this very amazing uh, Angolan pavilion in 2013 in Venice and won the Golden Lion for it. So um, the three of us are doing this project. Are you for real? And um, um, it's a fully digital project which can be understood as, let's say, a, cu a cultural experiment, um, looking for new ways, sorry, <laughs> looking for new ways of letting discourse and art come to life in an, I don't know, in the interactive um, in, and, and over the course of several months, constantly changing digital space. And it kind of fits into our thoughts at the end, uh, as we've been thinking about the, you know, quote unquote art space for a long time to, um, you know, to have an art space on Contemporary End as a platform uh, in which we could invite artists and curators to work on a project beyond visa restrictions, travel restrictions, etc. Because, you know, it's just easy to, to meet in this, um, in a digital space. Uh, but we always try to find is another language to describe um, a space for art or an art space without, you know, perpetuating the boring idea of showing a white cube in a digital context. So that was something we definitely strongly wanted to overcome, but still haven't found a, a way how to, to describe a room where you want to show contemporary art. And of course, you know, we're not alone with this task. I think every, every museum has, you know, is, is um, or they're all asking these questions right now. How can we show, um, uh, contemporary art or sorry, you know art itself in a digital space um, and the platform are you for real is inviting visual artists and poets academics coders or filmmakers who are addressing the material and immaterial um, aspects of the digital and how uh, they are perceived from you know the perspectives of various disciplines and 
Um, maybe to just give you an idea here, uh, um, are just some questions we'll ask ourselves in the frame of this project. Uh, or maybe, can you see, can you, you can go to the next slide. Um, and next one. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a piece, oh, I'm looking very forward to it. Uh, the, the launch of the project is on the 10th of uh, December, so very soon. And um, I, I, can, I, can leave, uh, I can leave the website um, in the chat, if you like. Uh, this is a room, um, an artist, uh, Nushi Nyazdani. She's an ethical designer and um, an artist um, created for uh, this project different rooms in which she uh, invited um, um, critical feminist artists to um, artists by musicians as well to um, kind of build um, their ideal space to um, communicate with us as uh, visitors. Can you go one? And these are the entrances to, for example, this is one world or room in which you can enter by one of these um, artists. and. Um, let me just finish with these uh, questions we ask ourselves around this um, project. Um, uh, realness exists on many levels and through different perspectives and temporalities. What is real about an entire continent, a country or a person? When do things become real? Does a perspective become more real when it's reflected by media interests? Are privileged perspectives more real than others? Who can judge if something is real? Who is allowed to judge? Is there greater realness today because we can experience more perspectives online? So, yes. Yeah, so let me just, is there another, is, is this the last picture? I don't, um, oh yeah, now then it's the last picture. Okay, so yeah, thanks, thanks so much uh, for the moment. <laughs> yes, I think that was. Thank you, thank you, Julia, for this um, mm -hmm. inspiring presentation. <laughs> um, and I think your, uh, the question you posed in the end mm -hmm. are quite um, mm -hmm. um, quite pressing for many of us in this mm -hmm. um, very uh, immediate situation, but also mm -hmm. in general, I think. So what is realness, what is truth, what is um, mm -hmm. fake and, and what not. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> maybe before we get to the questions from the chat, I just wanted mm -hmm. to... Uh, <clears throat> to get back to the very beginning of your talk when you mm. said that uh, museums and institutions, they tend, or there is this trend, so mm -hmm. to say, to decolonize um, institutions, collections yes. themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, you frequently collaborate with institutions that yes. are that have um, colonial traces, that have mm -hmm. these blanks in their collections or mm -hmm. even problematic um, Mm -hmm. problematic issues in their collections, in their programs, mm -hmm. and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. So maybe you could mm, elaborate a little bit on how you strategically mm -hmm. um, approach yes. those, those, uh, these kind of, yeah, yeah. of collaborations. That would be really interesting. Yes, yeah, it's interesting because this is something I, uh, we talked, because we invited Nora uh, to our seminar on museums <laughs> last semester, or the la no, two semesters ago. And we talked about this because um, the, the, the students, the master students, because it's a master Studiengang as well, um, Institute, and uh, they asked her like, by what should I do? Should I go inside the institution? Should I work against the institution from the outside? And she was, you know, you know her very well. She was like, yeah, you can do everything at the same time. You can be inside the institution and work against the institution and be outside as well. You know, if, you, if you're Fred Moten, you would say I'm inside the institution and work from it, get against it from the inside. But, uh, you know, more is more like you can do it from all, all, all sides. And this is a little bit what, how we do it as well, because we obviously are independent and work, do our own thing and um, work on our projects from the outside. But as well, as you say, we've been, you know, I've been working in institutions, uh, Yvette has been working inside institutions as well in the past. And um, when we work with institutions right now, like for example, the Museum Ludwig, or we work with the big museum right now um, on, um, then one of, you know, they have a big exhibition next year. And, you know, the museums are super insecure about everything right now, yeah? in terms of how can we say this, what can we show? Um, 
can we show uh, can we show an exhibition by a black person what you know where are the traps if we show it how how should we contextualize this how can we how, how do we describe this in the, on the wall text you know everything is put in question right now and there's this big insecurity which um, we experience right now because we get a lot of uh, requests and um, yeah requests from uh, museums right now on a weekly basis almost you know like help help calls almost and what we always um, say is of course you know if it fits, fits we work with them for example in this case of Museum Ludwig um, um, with the center but um, always obviously um, for example by going into their collection yeah into their book uh, library for example and, and the Museum Ludwig has a huge uh, library and um, art historic art history art historical library and um, we always say okay um, of course you have problematic books in your collection and they do have you know problematic very cliche stereotype stereotypical books on the typical German adventurer who goes to Namibia and comes back with a pile of big, you know, pictures with beautiful people on it, etc. And we show these books and we, um, we kind of present, you know, the ugly sides of the museum as well. We don't try to hide them, etc. And uh, this is, you know, the same which we do with HKV, the um, Transmediale team, for example, they weren't happy when we, you know, took out these, you know, old Dutch white man books and said, well, why these? And we said, yeah, you know, because it's part of your collection. And um, if you're open to, decol if you want to say decolonize yourself and be open um, to really start institutional change, you know, um, you should at least start, start with, you know, um, and, and presenting uh, unpleasant details from, for example, your collection, etc. And uh, what I think young artists should do, um, because, you know, the museums, you might need the museums, but the museums need you too. And you can always um, add demands on, on, on so for example, um, an event you do with them. If they invite you, you can always say, okay, I can work with you, but, you know, I want you to realize uh, uh, a workshop on, I don't know, institutional racism as well, et cetera. And I think it's a good moment right now to demand these things, you know, things which would have been impossible like 10 years ago or five years ago where everybody was like, oh, please, a young artist, let me, you know, uh, uh, my biggest goal is I finally have, you know, be part of a group show at, at the Museum Ludwig, et cetera. But now you can, you can demand things and this is a, a great, uh, great moment. And that's why, as I say, if we work with this institution, we always have this little catalog of, okay, we can do it, but we will do this and we will do this and we will do this. And it might be unpleasant, but if you don't want to do it, then you're not, you're not ready because this is the easiest step. The, you know, the, the hardest steps are, okay, you know, what, is, what about change? that goes deeper, you know, what yeah, about the institutional, yeah. the How structural about the change. Yeah. yeah, look at your, you look, look at your program to your team, you know, we, we just did a, not yours, but you know, we just did a, I had a Zoom call with um, a big museum in, in, in Germany and the, the uh, curatorial and program team was entirely white, which is fine, but you know, they, they said as well, of course, I look around, we're all white, so is this normal or where, where, is this the way to go? And, and, and obviously this is, these are the harder steps who hurt, you know, because um, you have to look at the different uh, areas, the institutional uh, of an institution, no? the, structure, the structures of an institution. You have to look at the Freundeskreis of your museum, you know, because this is really nasty. If you look at the Freundeskreis, they are, yeah, they're, you know, they're very old and very wide. So there's, you know, the program is, let's say, the easiest part to, to, mm -hmm. to claim or to, to at least um, claim that you change. If you say, okay, look at our global program. We have uh, five, five artists or, you know, uh, we, have five art, we have five exhibitions per year and three of them have a focus on, uh, um, I don't know, decolonial or global topics, etc. This is still easy, but the question is who's running, who's, who's, who's running these programs, who's, who's doing these exhibitions, you know, who's, um, who yeah, comes sure. up with these ideas. So it's, yeah. So it's a question of sus sustainable change, I, I guess. Yeah. But this is yeah. also a process of many, many steps, I guess. So yes, um, I don't know, I would, I, would, I would like to open up also for questions from our audience. Um, 
please let us know if there are any or in the chat and Beatrice will bring them in. The chat, there's just a note from Maren mm -hmm. Bolter. She says it's very interesting, but she had to leave. <laughs> well, oh, not no, we're not, no, we are not, but there we are not another, leaving yet. <laughs> yes, there's not a question in the chat yet. I see. So you can um, you can also use the hand in the yes. You raise Don't the hand and maybe. But maybe before make the we videos yeah. on. Yes. Um, so I would be also interested in how mm -hmm. you how you decide on content for the magazine. So mm -hmm. how is your decision process about mm -hmm. what will be published, what not, mm -hmm. where, where you put a focus on, where not? Because, you know, mm -hmm. obviously so much is happening, so many exhibitions, so many artistic practices. So there mm -hmm. must be, I don't know, a process of selection, I guess. Or And you mentioned your amazing network that probably mm -hmm. plays into this. So it would be great to, to get to know mm -hmm. more about this process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, Yvette and myself, we're both art historians, so we're kind of strict. And we come from, from an, you know, we, we both come from a, a German tra trained or, or Western trained um, art background, if you, if, if you like. And as I said, I, have to, I had to unlearn many perceptions and, and, and concepts in, in my head. But still, um, of course, the question of what is good art is something we had to leave behind uh, many years ago, and the, which is which is great. But still, um, maybe I don't know. It's not our secret, but we're very um, selective in terms of what makes sense to present and not, and not by any questions or quality, because the, the, this question doesn't exist, at least for us, when it comes to what is good or bad art. But more like what fits into the concept and discourse of, of our, or the concept of, of the discourses um, we are, we're dealing with at the end. And then in a way it kind of naturally or organically fits in, you know, um, because the thing is um, looking back uh, like seven years ago, we had to really build or, uh, and search for the network. And now um, the network is so big that we constantly get offers and pitches by um, writers who <clears throat> sit in, in, I don't know, in Houston or in, or in Accra in Ghana or in Nairobi, etc. And um, in a way, people have understood the way we're going and the, the language we're speaking. So um, it comes quite naturally now. So, mm -hmm. but for example, we would, <laughs> we would never, um, I don't know, feature Olaf for Eliasson just because he does a project in Nairobi or in, you know, in the Savannah or something like this. That, that wouldn't, wouldn't fit really, um, yeah. Maybe that mm -hmm. answers your question. Yeah, but still, if you get like proposals from from mm -hmm. uh, collaborators, you still have mm -hmm. to decide, or do you just publish everything that is no, of interest no, no. to you? So, so no, I no, guess no. you no, know, no. of course, you won't do something about. Um, uh, Carsten Höller or Olaf Wilson <laughs> or Jeff Koons. Carsten I wouldn't Hella. expect that. That would be yeah, yeah. interesting choice. But um, yeah, yeah. but do you do you do open calls for specific uh, thematic contexts or is it just that that it's in mm. the flow and in the process and people that work with you already know? So just you know. Yeah, it's both. Um, people who work with us obviously obviously know know the direction of our interest and in, you know, how we work and what you know what the, our discourses are um, on the other hand we say no to dozens dozens of pitches mm. and because obviously there are many who just want just not of interest for us because the the concept is boring or is you know and it doesn't matter if it comes from Africa or not if it's boring it's then you know then it doesn't um, it doesn't interest us and um, maybe that's there's the balance of um, that we obviously select, uh, but as well, um, topics come in by uh, writers um, or people from the network who know how how we work and what uh, our focus or our interests is. We don't do open calls for 
for, uh, for, uh, for writers or for topics because there again we have this huge network of people who we can just ask oh, we do want to do something on um, I don't know um, coding in the arts do you have someone in mind who could do something in yeah these different areas so and that that comes quite naturally mm -hmm. yeah so yes <coughs> sorry <laughs> no problem <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I ask a question? Of course. <clears throat> um, well, first of all, thank you for uh, the really nice and interesting lecture and the presentation of your work. And um, I was, um, uh, besides browsing through the online content, which is really interesting and very well presented, and you've mentioned um, mm -hmm. publishing by the Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen and the support mm -hmm. of the Federal uh, Foreign Office. Mm -hmm. And um, and also you have mentioned the troubles you were facing in um, uh, certain countries. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, freedom of speech and the freedom mm -hmm. of, um, yeah, say, journalism expression. or writing mm -hmm. and expression. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, first of all, how did you um, build build up your, um, say, uh, financial structure of financing mm -hmm. your work to be able mm -hmm. to act so um, freely and independently? How mm -hmm. do you how do you keep it up? Mm -hmm. And let say from the from the beginning, mm -hmm. and uh, how do you um, deal with uh, these kind of issues um, that you mentioned, like uh, regarding? Mm -hmm. Um, restrictions, local restrictions, and and other mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. obstacles or trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. No, the first um, um, the first aspect uh, of the financing is obviously <laughs> always the biggest topic behind the scenes. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned already, um, we're funded by the state. Uh, the German state in this case, so we kind of are uh, financially not depending on, as I say, uh, as, as, as I mentioned already, you know, raising paywalls in order to get in, you know, money. So the content doesn't cost anything thanks to the funding we're receiving by the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen uh, on a yearly basis for the last seven years now. So this is kind of fixed. It's not a huge amount, but um, we can, as you see, we can work with this. But um, over the course of the years, um, and, and the IFA was the one who kind of gave us angel or initial funding as well to, to build the whole thing, yeah? And the Auswärtige Amt, so the uh, Office of Foreign Relations as well. Foreign Affairs, sorry, pardon, Foreign Affairs. And um, obviously because they are very interested in um, um, having obviously more, um, not not only cultural but economic relations with Africa as well and interests with Africa. Um, but having said that, because you asked about the um, um, freedom we have in creating what we do, this is something um, which is in a way we're extremely uh, happy with because the IFA leaves us all the freedom we can just, imag just imagine. So we can, we can do whatever we want. We don't have to, you know, if the foreign, um, um, the Außen Minister, yeah, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs travels to uh, Angola. We don't have to cover anything, you know, we don't have to cover that. We don't have to um, focus on um, German political, cultural political topics. We can ju literally, do, literally do what we want. And this is, um, yeah, this is uh, a big, big uh, help to, in order to do what we do and uh, helped us a lot to create what we, what we did. Um, then these things, for example, like the center, this, this uh, reading room uh, was something we just not invented, but um, came up with during the last years. And um, these things, for example, because, you know, it, 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 uh, uh, it works, collaborates with these different museums. And through this, we uh, earn money as well, or contemporary and, you know, earns money because obviously it is like an um, artistic participation. You know, we bring this, uh, they invite us to show uh, the center um, in the museum. And obviously we get a fee for this. And this fee flows into a contemporary end as well. So it's not a fee for me or for Yvette, but um, it goes all into um, contemporary end. And this is this kind of uh, 
mix works very well, at least right now. And um, the other thing is, um, as I mentioned, with uh, kind of uh, offering protection um, for writers um, in um, sensitive um, or yeah, sensitive areas, having to deal with censorship, etc. Um, as I said, we again work with a big network of, in this case, NGOs and um, initiatives who really focus their work on um, um, artist safety, who, uh, if it really gets serious, who can um, organize um, that um, the writers, for example, um, get like a safety or a safe space for a certain amount of time, let's say for having, for six months outside that country in, in another European country, for example, or, you know, somewhere, somewhere safe, yeah? And this organization we're working with, we never, thank God, had, you know, had the, more, had the had situation where we had to, had to do this or had to save someone and get him or her out of the country. But we obviously um, know of many cases of more like um, literature writers who, um, who came, you know, into these very serious moments or situations where they, um, these initiatives uh, had to, um, uh, had to help them to get uh, out of the country. So that's why, again, here as well, uh, a network of supporters is super important because, um, um, yeah, there's there's a lot going on, but there's um, a big network of um, initiatives as well who work particular in these fields and um, have different expertises for different needs, let's say. So, yeah. Timo, if that answered your, yeah, your yeah, question. Thank you. Thanks a lot. A little bit. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? I don't see uh, everybody here on the screen, so please just let me know. Otherwise, I would yeah. have one last question because we're a bit running um, out of time and we're trying, you know, with this digital format to stick yeah. to 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 the given time frame that we have as it's also quite demanding <laughs> on everybody but uh, my last yeah. question would be as you you know you, <laughs> you just gave us gave us a very short yeah. small insight in all these uh, different activities that you started starting with mm -hmm. the magazine but also expanding mm -hmm. to other fields so I would be um, interested in mm -hmm. uh, where do you see contemporary and like in five years, what would be, um, <laughs> what would be, what do you envision for a contemporary and in the near future? So you, you showed us this digital mm -hmm. exhibition project. Um, does it go in this direction? So what would you envision for, for the near future for contemporary and? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we sometimes say is ideally the, 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 the ideal scenario was, would be that uh, you wouldn't need a platform such as Contemporary End in five years anymore. You know, that would be the ideal uh, scenario because, you know, museums, uh, cultural institutions, etc., would have obviously, you know, we're talking about long-term uh, sustainable change, yeah, would come to the point where you wouldn't separate between us and the others between, um, you know, global art, but obviously we're not part of the global art world. We, we're the art world and the global is the rest, right? So if we have kind of managed to overcome these categories and this thinking of the, within these categories, then, um, you know, obviously a platform such as The End, uh, which tries to, to open discourse, but it's uh, still we have this focus, you know, we have this focus and we don't name it all the time, it's Africa, Africa, but still we have this focus because there's still a need for a platform which creates kind of visibility and connects these voices, etc. Yeah? And then it, ideally in 10 years you wouldn't need this kind of um, special place anymore. But um, um, if we look at shorter, <laughs> shorter, like three, four years uh, uh, perspective, uh, what, what, what we have in mind for the nearer future, what we want to or would love to um, invest in more is to um, to create more sustainable structures in the different cities we're working with here yeah? because we have as I said we have these uh, people we've been working for the last four five six years in Lagos in 
uh, in Nairobi, etc., <clears throat> and would love to um, to to create like hubs there, uh, support hubs, like just just like small office structures where you have you know a desk and 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 and, and internet and and can just work, have a little structure where the different um, you know, we have one person we we're working with, but youngster writers can can kind of get the feeling that there's a, a physical place where they can go and exchange and, and and just have a place, yeah, and feel not safe, but just feel um um feel supported in a way, yeah. And this is something we uh want to try to work more or to focus more on. Of course, it costs money. That's why we're not there yet, and um. The other things are, are to 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 um, to expand even more in uh, in let's say in the field of the digital. That's what we've been doing um, already for the last maybe two years, and we're just starting a, a bigger um, um, project next year. So in January, um, over the course of one to two years, um, focusing on the aspect of education in a digital format by um, uh, let's say inviting youngster um, coders um, slash artists to, uh, to to think about um, or to look into curricula in for example African um, universe um, art academies who are still very um, influenced by European um, curricula and, and structures etc when it comes to um, knowledge yeah cultural knowledge and um, the idea is that the youngster uh, coders kind of um, what is it um, not code uh, create create games and VR games and and and, um, and 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 films around these these topics of uh, um, a, a I don't want to say the word but um, um, decolonial curriculas in in Africa in African um, um, educational systems etc so this this is yeah this is something we're working on uh, from next year on yes wow julia thank you so so much for yeah. your presentation um we will continue tomorrow um with a, a group of you know uh, ecm students um mm -hmm. but um for tonight i really thank you so so much for your time mm -hmm. uh, thank you and I thank um, all the audience, um, everybody who joined us um, here on this yes. platform. And we are looking forward to the next um, public talk, of course, that will be announced in due course. Um, and for now, I think, um, yeah, I wish you all a very nice evening and I hope to see you back very soon. Yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> and let me maybe just quickly put the mm -hmm. I for real project oh yeah the instagram instagram mm -hmm. uh let me see I info, and then you can yeah this is the instagram uh handle or name yeah if you like you can you can have Perfect. a look okay thank you thank so, you bye bye thanks so much yeah bye. to all of